Hi guys, I am here with video game and esports specialist Patrick Scott Patterson, who has just returned back within the past day or so from E3. Um, so tell us a little bit about how E3 was like for you this year and a little bit about the E3 takeover that you seem to have been posting all over Twitter. Uh, well, E3 this year was, you know, amazing. Run. I mean, it always is, of course. E3 every year, I mean, it's the biggest event in North America, and literally the who's who of the video gaming world uh, is within those walls, as well as, you know, all the latest and greatest and upcoming games. But, you know, this year had an interesting little buzz to it that um, maybe hadn't existed in the past few years, because I don't know that the people attending E3 this year were really expecting I guess, I guess too, too much. much. Maybe, Maybe their expectations were a little more tempered than the past couple of years where we had new consoles coming out and that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. But um, there was really something for everybody in this one. And, and I think once people started to see the press conferences and started to go in there and get their hands on some things, they started to see that. They started seeing how... Uh, you know, literally, whether you're, you know, you're wanting a you know, great first-person shooter or something original or you're old school or regardless of your console present or uh, preference, not presence, regardless of your console preference, if you're still into that sort of thing, there's something for you. There's something to be excited about. And, uh, and it came to carry over. There were just as many people lining up on, on the third day, on Thursday, as there were, you know, Tuesday and Wednesday morning. You usually don't see that. Um, but people want to get, the, get in there and get their hands on this stuff while there's still time. Right. So the E3 Takeover, that was a group of uh, gamers that you had formed together to kind of just take over E3 then and kind of just raid all the different stations? Yeah. Right, okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, since I know you are a huge Nintendo fan, what your opinion was about the Nintendo digital event? I know that for a lot of us it was a little, yeah, <laughs> it was a little underwhelming. Like the games looked cool and interesting, but there wasn't really a lot of hype. And I personally would have loved to hear a little bit about the uh, NX their new console, but they said we won't hear about that now until next year. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not a big fan of, of how Nintendo does those in general. Um, you know, I, I was watching it with a group of people who were watching it on Twitch from a station live at the side of the event. And yeah, everybody was kind of chill and kind of relaxed. Even when there was stuff that seemed interesting up on there, where we're like, you know, okay, we got puppets. Uh, and, 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 you know, you know just seemed to, to, to kind of lack that, that, uh, that fire that, you know, comes, comes with E3. Uh, I, I miss when, when they would do a big press conference, just like everybody else would. You know, right. I mean, that's part of what E3 is about, is not just, you know, showing off the new stuff, but showing it off with some fanfare and some bomb and circumstance. And this was just kind of relaxed and seemed like it could have, this could have run at any time, not necessarily E3. And, um... So, you know, that, that's, that's, that's Nintendo. Nintendo. I know Nintendo, Nintendo does, does things their own way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I guess puppets, puppets were kind of neat. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you weren't a fan a of the spin. puppets? Well, well I, was I was actually, actually I, I would have liked them more, I think, if the puppets, you know, like they actually were giving away, you know, hand puppets or something at the Nintendo booth or something. I don't know. Um, but, but I mean, I, I, I can see where you come from, from and, and for my for my seat, it was kind of even more so, because every, every year when you go down at E3 to the Nintendo, Nintendo booth itself, mm -hmm. it's larger than life, and it's bursting with color, right. and there's lines, and everyone's excited to be there and to see what they got, mm -hmm. and I just don't think that's captured to the audience outside of E3 by presentations like that. No, and I personally would have actually, like, loved to see them actually, like, on stage and like actually giving a presentation rather than make it into a digital presentation like they did. I completely um, agree. I mean, it I'm feels sure it's a little, like, sorry, it feels a little like detached. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure that you know, budget wise, it's very friendly to do it this way. But again, this is E3, you know, and it's, uh, you know, E3, it's bigger and better, it's exciting. You also got to think about this, that's coming after uh, Bethesda, Bethesda and Microsoft and EA and Sony, and all of them have done these big, elaborate setups, right? 
Right. And, and then here's Nintendo, Nintendo and it's it's that, you know, and and, and it doesn't make too much sense to me either because it's not like Reggie and Yamoto and people it's not like they're not there at E three. Mm-hmm. They're flying them in anyway. Let's put them up on stage. stage. Let's get a little hype because I mean, Nintendo's, Nintendo's got, got some good stuff out right now. They got some good stuff coming up. Um, yeah. you know, get that excitement. Get that buzz behind it. Well, I would have almost, you, you know, you go down to Nintendo's booth on the E3 floor, and it's always shoulder to shoulder people, and it's bright, and colorful, and exciting. And yeah, their their you know little digital press conference was not was you know an infomercial. I would have um. I would have almost liked to seen. Um, I know that there was uh, Reggie had done a like little like hype like exhibition thing with uh, Hungrybox and Smash, and I would have liked to actually see that happen. Like not before like their actual presentation. It would have been kind of hype to see it during their presentation and everything actually live. That way we could see it on stage and you know be hype in that moment um so it was a little unfortunate i'm i'm hoping that the n x whatever their new console is is going to be that presentation is a little more uh exciting um yeah i also also would have liked to have seen them um i mean super Super mario Mario maker Maker. That's that's, that's that's gonna be huge for Nintendo. Nintendo. I mean, that's that's, that's, that's gonna, gonna be that's, that's the best executed idea they've had in a long time. time. I would have liked to have seen maybe an on-screen, like a live on-stage demo for everyone else out there to see not just how this works, but just how easy it is to quickly put together a Super Mario level on that game. Um, obviously, again, you're at the E3 show floor. You get your hands on there. You get to you get to figure out how easy it is and exciting it is to. To sit there and create and come up with something on the fly, and, and that this wasn't captured in this you know, pre-recorded presentation, where it kind of showed how you do it, but it didn't really express just how fun and how easy it is. No, it and, and it's a fantastic concept. I mean, I as a long time fan of Super Mario since I was a little girl. I mean, I was like, oh, I can create my own. That's awesome. But that when I was watching their like video footage of it in a digital event, I was a little, I mean, I was a little bored to be exactly. honest exactly. with you with it. And I kind of just started doing my own thing, listening to it in the background, waiting for them to bring up their next game or whatever it is they were going to announce. So, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Where did, how did you get to where you are now at this time? Um, writing for video games, speaking at different panels. I, th- I know you did a panel with Stan Lee not that long ago, where you were on a panel with Stan Lee, I believe. Um, how do you get to this point, being kind of like an advocate for video games and esports and kind of speaking all over the world now? Well, I mean, it, it really just started when I was a little kid and, uh, you know, sunk a quarter in a Pac-Man machine for the first time. and. You know, was amazed at, at what you know came before my face, and, and realizing that you know, wow. I mean, this is uh, you know, I, at that age, I'd already been exposed to you know TV and music and, and film and sports and that sort of thing. But you know, nothing had made me just go wow like video games did. And so it just it became you know my first real passion in life, and uh, not just playing them, but learning everything I could about them. For years and years and years. And, and before it was called video game history, it was just called reading about video games. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, over time, you know, uh, passions can become professions. And I wasn't uh, particularly happy with what I was doing for a paycheck. And I was chasing another dream for a little while and got to a point where I had kind of reached a crossroads. And decided to kind of dive back into, you know, full gaming thing. I continued to game and to study that sort of thing the whole time. I kind of dive into it and figure out how to turn my passion into a profession. Um, and I ended up kind of a million miles away from where I originally was doing it, which originally was just repairing and restoring vintage arcade games and that sort of thing. But, you know, the economy hit some things and I fell into some other opportunities. And, uh, you know, I, I 
wondered, wondered for years why there isn't like this go-to expert, expert for this sort of thing that can speak on video games, you know, past, present, and future. Right. We got yeah. ones that can speak to certain genres or to the modern day, but, mm-hmm. or or, it, or the ones that can do this sort of thing, but they keep it within this kind of confined, you know, gaming space. And not really really outside into the broader, you know, general world, uh, general general mainstream mainstream media, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And And so, you know, one day I had an epiphany. Um, (laughs) I uh, had, it was 2009, and I had uh, almost fell, kind of fell into the opportunity to work with uh, G4 TV, Mm -hmm. uh, part of their E3 broadcast for a stunt they were doing there. Um, Steve Weeby was, was going for the Donkey Kong, Kong World Record live. It was the first time there had ever been a live world record attempt on a game like that, past or, you know, or since. Um, and it, it fell into an increasingly larger role with that because there's things they were discovering that I knew about this, technically, history-wise, all that, that nobody else there did. And we pulled it off. Um, and I sat there, it was like a light just popped in my face, being like, all of this stuff that I've done my whole life that didn't seem like it was, you know, important things and some things that I more did because I loved it more than anything else, all came together and provided something tangible for a television network or a live broadcast or the biggest gaming event there is. Wait a minute. I could be that person. Instead of wondering why there isn't that person out there, maybe I, I can do it. Why not me? Why not, you know, I apparently I was qualified as anyone else is going to be. So right. mm-hmm. uh, I kind of was like, you know, pointed at the wall, kind of like Babe Ruth, and like, I'm going to go there. I had no idea how, um, because it's not really an established type of space, you know. If I said I was a sports analyst or a food critic or a book critic or a film critic or, or something like that, people go, oh, okay, they get it. Um, you know. With, With me, me maybe, maybe they don't quite understand what it is I'm trying to do, or at least some didn't, or at least some, didn't, some still don't. But, you know, it, after that, it's just kind of like research and trial and error and long-term planning and just hustle. You know, I'm up at 6 a.m. every day, seven days a week. I rarely take any days off. Um, I'll take some time out for my family each day or what have you, but it's just, you know, it's a constant hustle and push, push, push. And, uh... Seeing, seeing what works and seeing what doesn't, and uh, over, over time, time it finally started to turn into something tangible, and uh, people, people are starting to get it, and um, you know it's starting to, to, to turn into some, some really exciting, exciting things, things on the side. Wait, and now you write for several, um, you write for several different websites, correct? About video games and. Yeah, among other things, other things. Um, that's, that's you know, writing is, is something, something that was an early passion of mine. Uh, I was a journalism major, though I don't classify what I do in the gaming space as journalism because I really don't report so much on what happens. I'm kind of a pundit, or I tell people stories, you know, feature stuff. Um, and I've also you know, appeared in a lot of news broadcasts, radio shows, uh, quite a few documentary films, some of which are recently released, some are coming up whole lot of things behind the scenes that is on camera type of things. Um, and right now the writing thing is sort of, uh, I'm doing more of it now than I have in years, but more because, it, more because it's opportunity and a means to an end right now. Uh, the ultimate thing is to be involved with broadcast type of things, whether on camera or producing or both. There's a lot of things like that that are in the works right now. What are some of the topics that you write about or speak about at various different events? Uh, well, I mean, three of them that I always, I always seem to come, come back to. Uh, one, one is the history of all of this. Um, I mean, right, right now you have more people out there than ever who you know, call themselves video gamers, or at least are video gamers, maybe if they don't wear that label. Uh, more, more people, people than ever do, speaking, speaking about, about it, writing about it, all that sort of thing. thing. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem like our history is really is embraced or embraced accurately as I would like it to be. Um, being someone who's you know lived through it and come up through it, sometimes it's like, wow, you know. I mean, I just I just did a piece that will run uh, uh, G4 Sci-Fi Games tomorrow, talking about not only is it Atari's. Uh, birthday, birthday, the original founding of Atari's birthday, birthday here in wow. a few days, but why the younger generation needs to stop looking at Atari as this, you know, 
thing that failed and, and what have you. They kind of dismiss it now and embrace the history for what it really is. Well, Atari was one of the first gaming consoles that came out, was it not? Yeah, well, yeah, it was an early one. Uh, it helped establish all kinds of things we have now, and it's featured in there. And, you know, I think that that history needs to be understood and celebrated, just like it is in any other form of entertainment. Because to understand where we are and where we're going means you got to understand how we got there and who got us there. And that's a big part, too, because a lot of our pioneers, unfortunately, we're starting to lose some of them. You know, Ralph Bear passed away last year. Uh, we lost Steve Bristow, who was an Atari pioneer. We lost Dougie Smith, who created uh, Load Runner, you know, had level editors and stuff like that in it. Right. Um, we lost Jack Trammell. We've lost some of the, the early pioneers of this whole thing. Uh, and you know, we're getting to that point where the ones that are still here now, let's get the stories out of them. Let's celebrate them. Let's make sure they get their due in their own lifetime. Um, so timing is kind of paramount on this. Uh, some of it will happen, I think, organically over time, um, because the generations of people who grew up gaming like us are going to be the ones who inherit the earth, so to speak. But by that point in time, we are going to have lost a lot of opportunities to capture and, and, and catalog a lot of history. So that's something I fight for a lot. And then the other two that I often fight for a lot is really kind of the true nature of diversity in the video game world, uh, especially when it involves uh, women in the video game world, who have always been part of video gaming. This whole time, I can prove it historically through the uh, extensive archives that I've collected over the decades. And, and why I think so much of the, the, the controversy about it now is, is unwarranted, because a lot of it's painting video gaming as you know, being a boys club this whole time, and it really never was. Um, and then also, you know, fighting against that old, very tired violence in video game debate. That yeah. <laughs> it seems like it comes up every so often, uh, you know, and, and it's been going on since the mid-1970s. And, and, you know, unfortunately, I think one of the reasons why the media keeps going back to that narrative is because there hasn't been a lot of people in their eyes fighting against it. No. Uh, so, so I like, I like to, to be one of those people that fights against it because yeah, yeah, I, I want, want that very tired narrative to go away. Um, I, I think it's very unfair. I think it causes a lot. And not just it's not just because I'm a gamer. gamer. I want to be like, like I, don't I don't agree with this. this. You're wrong. But, but no. you got to but but look, look at this as is, is a legal thing. How much taxpayer how much taxpayer money is wasted on trying to regulate or censor these games. I mean, think about Brown versus EMA years ago. The state of California had to pay back millions of legal fees at a time where they were broke um, because uh, of trying to push through this law that wasn't constitutional in the first place. Something that if they had even known their own history or done their own research, they would have seen it was a waste of time. Anyway, those political leaders should be fighting, to, you know, spending their time fighting for things that actually have value to the general public and not wasting the taxpayer dollars like that. Right. And now let's let's talk a little bit about that one topic of violence in video <clears throat> games, since that seems to be a topic that doesn't really ever go away and it can't seem to be resolved and i think that that's a little bit to do with uh how video games are kind of uh stereotyped into their own little section um so uh you often hear that video games are the reason for kids acting out in violence or an adult acting out in violence because say one or two kids out of the millions and billions that actually play video games will say, oh, well, I saw it in this game, so I thought it would be cool to reenact it, and then all of a sudden, everybody focuses on that one person and not the other ones that are playing all the time. And this is especially pertains to the community that I'm active in, which is the fighting game community. And in the FGC, obviously, we are a bunch of gamers that play fighting games and you know you got Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat and you know Smash and Tekken and Killer Instinct and all of these games obviously they're violent in some sort of way because I mean you're fighting each other in the game with these different characters but 
me personally, um, I would never harm a fly in <laughs> real life. I'm not a violent person, but I absolutely love fighting games and I've loved them since I was a little kid. And I'm around all these people all the time and I, none of them are violent people. They haven't committed any crimes. I know of a good majority of them. They're like every other person. They just enjoy the game. So I, I'm curious your opinion on why you think this stereotype of violence and video games being the reason are one of the main reasons for crime. I'm curious your opinion on that and why you think that occurs. Well, you yeah, know, I mean, unfortunately, we seem to live in a society these days where personal accountability is no longer at the forefront. It's, it's almost like the media doesn't, doesn't want, want to actually blame people, people for behavior choices or, or what have you. So, so they, they like, like to point at other things. things. You know, they, they like to they like to point at the fast food places and blame them for you know if, if you gain weight rather than the fact that you made a conscious choice to go eat there. Right. Or you know they, they want to look at things like that. I mean, I often joke that if Pac-Man was a new game today, they'd probably blame it for childhood obesity. <laughs> um, you know, it's it, it's. What, what a lot of these people don't understand is that it's not that the world imitates what they see in video games. Video games reflect what happens in the real world. Um, you know, they always bring up Grand Theft Auto. It's like Grand Theft Auto isn't influencing the real world. The real world influenced the content in Grand Theft Auto. If these things didn't exist in the real world, they wouldn't be in the game. And... Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, they, they look at them, um, and I think a lot of it's just misunderstanding. Because to me, you know, to, to sit there and ignore that there's violent movies and there's violent uh, television programs and things like that, and then only focus on video games is, 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 is hypocritical. And I think it's because from their seat, they still see video games the kids thing or what have you. Or, or some, some of them, them think, oh, they're so, so realistic, realistic, which is complete, complete garbage. garbage. <laughs> but they're, they're so, so realistic, realistic that they, you know, they, they're, they're murder simulators. simulators. And, and you know, know, to, to me, me, it's like, like look, I played Madden, Madden pretty, pretty much every version of Madden ever released going back into the 1990s. And I'm not going to be able to go out to the NFL Combine. You know, I've played racing games, and I'm not eligible to go qualify for NASCAR. Uh, you know, um, I don't, I play a lot of Tetris, but I'm not, as you can probably see behind me, post E3, not the most organized person in the world. But, uh, you know, I, I play a lot of Mario, I've never felt compelled to jump on a turtle and kick it. Uh, you know, it's just, they want to just look at this one thing, and I think a lot of it comes back, they, they, since they do think of it as a kid's thing, and again, personal accountability. They don't want to talk to parents. They don't want to point at parents. They want to blame the industry or they want to blame games. And they don't want to look at parents and be like, parents, if your kids are playing these games, you know, be there for them and help guide them, have some parental guidance or check them out yourself. Most of these parents probably are players anyway. Or, you know, at least accept the fact that can video games influence youth? Yes, yes, they, they can. can. If, if the, the those kids, kids don't have a strong adult, a strong parental influence in their life, no, no, no influence in any type of media, any type of anything can replace or outdo parental influence, parental guidance. Right. Um, you and me both know, because we are closer to this. That a lot of parents will just shove a video game console in the kids' room and. and Kids, kids will play, play whatever. whatever. I, I know I've experienced, experienced you know, being a late night, night it's like a midnight on a Wednesday during a school year, and there's some 15 year old, 14, 15 year old kids screaming anti Semitic, racist, sexist remarks at the top of their lungs in an online game. Where is the parent? How do they not know that's going on? That's not the game's fault or anything like that. Where's the parent? Are they not paying, they're paying so little attention, they're not listening or hearing that, they don't know, they're not putting a stop to it. Um, it, it comes, comes down, down to them, them. And, and, and I, I just think, think a lot of it's because they see video gaming as this easy scapegoat, especially now. It bothers the hell out of me when they're, they're like, okay, well, this 21-year-old shooter, and they went and searched his home, and they found an Xbox and a copy of Call of Duty. It's like, you're playing the odds at this point. 
right? right? Find, Find me someone, someone that age, age that doesn't have a video, video game console and a copy of a Call of Duty. Duty. You, you might as well blame shoes, toothbrush. I'm sure they were found there too. Um, well, no, you know, I, they're I looking at it and they're playing the odds. And, right. You know, and, and, and it's, it's important to speak out against this. this. Not just like the taxpayer dollar thing I mentioned earlier, but it also overshadows other things. A lot of these school shooters, yeah, yeah did they, they have, have video, video games in common? common? Of course they, they did. They were of an age of a generation where video games are, are that's common in entertainment. But it also seems to overlook the fact that a lot of them were on prescription medications for depression or that they didn't have a strong family life or um, they weren't diagnosed or unable to receive treatment for mental illness or emotional distress of some, some kind. kind. Those, Those are the, the real issues. issues. So, so when I speak out against, you know, the media narrative of violent video games, it's not just because I'm a video gamer and I want them to stop pointing at what I love. It's because, because they're missing the actual issues that can prevent more of these things from happening. happening. But I think it's easier and probably, I'll go ahead and say it, outside of the media's backroom interests in some cases, to blame the video game than it is to blame some, some sort of pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical or to blame the viewers who might be parents uh, uh, for this sort of thing happening. And I think that's part of why. I think they see it as an easy target because there's not a lot of people out there like myself that are going to tell them or to stick their opinion in that regard. Right. And, and I definitely think I agree with you on a lot of the uh, things that you were discussing. And one of the things I definitely agree on is um, the parents' role in regards to video games. I, you know, I had video games when I was a kid. You know, my mom bought me my first, you know, Game Boy Color when I was nine or ten years old. Um, when it, around the time that it had first come out, and for me, I was always taught the difference between reality and fiction. That a game, a movie, you know, Absolutely. any of that or music, it was art it was being created it was a story being told it wasn't you know quote unquote real even when you're basing something on a true story the reality of is of it is is that person's not really going out and doing those things it's a cartoon it's created and i feel that that's something that's very important to teach a child when you're learning and you know growing up um being able to, I, I wouldn't say completely like monitor and hover over, you know, your your kid, but you know, making sure that they're not getting, you know, those, you know, if you're a parent and you don't want your kid to play a violent game, then there are games that are rated. You know, games have ratings for a meeting just for the same meeting that say. A movie does. Movies have R ratings because there's violence, there's nudity. It's the same concept when it comes to a CD that has a mature rating on it. And the same thing for a video game. Mortal Kombat is rated M for a reason. And anybody who has played any of the Mortal Kombat games will know exactly why that game is rated M. So if you yes. get your kid you know, your eight-year-old, a game like that, and you don't teach them the difference between that being not real as opposed to reality and teaching your kid morals, and then they have a issue with that concept and understanding that it is not the game's fault. The game is rated that rating for a reason, and for all you know, it could have been the psychology with the way the kid was wired at the kid had any psychological conditions and I think that those are things that the media oftentimes doesn't look into. They like to focus on the fact that, you know, look at video games and I think that it's unfortunate that that happens because if people really paid attention and the media did, they would understand that I mean, video games brings in like more money than <laughs> You know, sometimes even the film or the music industry and there are so many people involved in it and it's just viewed so much as this negative thing but what's interesting about that is this whole concept of esports that has been popping up more and more in the 
uh, past couple of years and it's been kind of growing. And through that, it seems like the gaming community is kind of taking this huge shift. And, you know, we have all these different sections, the fighting game community, you have your land games and, you know, your puzzle game tournaments and all of that. And it's all taking this big shift where more and more money is getting dropped into it and different organizations jumping in saying, yeah, I want to be a part of this big shift. And it's starting to be socially accepted. And I think that that is where this conflict is sort of struggling right now because you have like those people that don't want to let it change and let it be socially accepted and let people finally see the gaming community for what it really is, for who we really are. And then you have those who want to see a change, those gamers that are like, yes, and they fight and they advocate for it and they, you know, try to be involved in it every day and publicize that. And then you have the gamers that aren't quite sure. They kind of have this fear of accepting it. They're like, oh, well, what if it changes for the negative? What if it doesn't you know, work out the way they're claiming it's going to and they, they hold back. Um, so what are your views on those different areas of this kind of transition for the gaming scene in regards to esports and social acceptance? Well, you know, I argue somewhat that the social acceptance is already there. Um, a lot more people play video games than identify with themselves as gamers. Um, I, I see it, it all the time, time especially when I travel. travel. You know, I'll go on, you know, go on an airplane, and, and there's more people on there playing games on their tablets and stuff, and watching movies and that sort of stuff. And not the types of people that you know are gonna you know go go check out you know gaming websites when they get home. Um, right. Yeah, you know, sort of thing. And you don't get the numbers of something like these Call of Duty games or Grand Theft Auto Five or whatever by just selling to this hardcore niche community. You don't get them with that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I see, see this, this all the time. time. There, there are people who are, they're, they're reluctant, reluctant to change out of, out of fear. fear. But to, to me, you know, you, you, you got to stick with it. it. You know, as, as long, long as you sit there and let things change and evolve and, and, and develop, and, develop and, 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 and you're keeping yourself in there, you're keeping your voice heard, you're keeping your hand in there, you can help make sure that you don't lose it. It doesn't become something you don't want it to become. Because, because you're, you're still, still there, there. You, you know, know be, be active, active be, be proactive, proactive in the gaming, gaming community, community. Right. and let, let your voice be heard, and be active, active and, 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 and go, go to these events, and let your feedback, positive, positive constructive, constructive feedback, feedback, I might add, add, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of negative out there as well, but let that oh, be. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah, to me, it's, it's, it's long overdue, and it needs to happen. Um, and, and, and for, for those, those, there's some, too, that seem to insist that still, it's still this niche thing and they, that they, they have, have to protect it, they have to keep it, they have to defend it. And for them, i got news for them, it's not. It's not that niche thing anymore. All you got to do is look at the revenue and look at the numbers and look at this sort of thing and accept the fact that this has happened, but that's a good thing. Uh, I look a lot at uh, the comic book industry. There's a lot of parallels here because comic books for a long time we're, we're looked, looked at, at as that same type of thing. thing. It's it's social outcast. It's not cool and hip to like mm -hmm. these things. It's, it's only for a bunch of nerds and antisocial this or that. that. And there, there were those that were, you know, trying, trying to keep it a certain level and keep it a certain way. And, and then, then here you came with a movie property and it blew up. And then here came some more. And so now comic books are considered cool and socially acceptable. Because they're, they're making bank, bank at the box office, office and merchandising and all of that sort of thing. Right. And, 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 and I know there's comic book fans that don't like that. There's, there's some that still wish to keep a certain way, but at the same time, how cool is it to be able to walk into any store and buy merchandise, buy shirts, buy adult shirts uh, for, uh, for your favorite comic book characters and watch them on TV and all this stuff and see that there's a quality control. To see that there's licensed properties that have movies and TV shows made about them that never would have been possible even five years ago. There's, there's a big bonus to it because you're able 
to celebrate your fandom of that at a level, level that you never have been before, before and meet more people than ever before that are just as into it as you. And it's the same thing with this whole thing with gaming, especially esports. Because it's the same type of thing. And it, maybe to appreciate it more yet. So, you know, I, mean, I remember the early days of competitive gaming. Uh, I remember the 1990 Nintendo World, World Championships. Championships. I remember how the things that came after that and how small scale most of that stuff was, except for the Nintendo World Championships back then. And right. to see what it's turned into now and be like, wow, I'm selling out the Staples Center. They're airing on ESPN2. The whole issue of ESPN the magazine right now is based on video games. This is incredible. This is awesome. This is overdue. This is exciting. Because right. what we're seeing right now is finally, you know, we're coming home. The world is starting to realize what we've always realized. Exactly. And that's a good thing. Because the more revenue that's coming in, the more attention this sort of stuff is getting, the more things, just like with the comic book, what's happening with that in the movies and all that. With video gaming, we're going to have more choices. We're going to have more products. We're going to have more merchandising. We're going to be seeing professional gamers that have worked hard to perfect their skills they're actually competing for tangible amounts of money now and sponsorships and things like that that sort of thing never existed in the 80s and the 90s no it didn't exist back then it doesn't exist with certain niche competitive gaming things now where you know the prize might be 500 dollars hey 500 dollars is nothing to sneeze at but i mean come on it's not what it could be it's not what it should be um, you know, it's, it benefits all of us. You also got to think about job creation. Here's something I think is missed with esports. Um, people see esports and they're like, "Well, I could be a comp I can't be a competitor in that. That's not my game, or that's not my genre, or maybe it's not the right point in my life." I mean, I know I can't really compete on games anymore because I've got two young kids. They deserve that attention. And I've got a career and other things involving gaming that take up my time. I don't have time to play a game for 8, 10, 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. But there's other opportunities in there. Watch an NFL game. It's not just the players on the field. It's the broadcasters and the producers and the uh, halftime experts and you know the coaches and the training staff. And there's so many things around that. Esports has that same potential. So, so even, even if you're not a competitor, competitor or, maybe or maybe you're, you're afraid, afraid of the great, great unknown, unknown, maybe you're, you're never, never going to be a competitor, but there's, but there's think about it, it this opens, opens up the possibility for so many more jobs in the video game world than just the being, you know, developers and, and, and programmers and things like that. that. Obviously, God, God bless them, without them, them we wouldn't have anything. Right. But it opens up so many other possibilities for to make a living in a video game world. Come on, man. There's a lot of people out there right now watching this. I know they don't like what they do for a paycheck. They don't like what they do for a living. They'd rather be doing something in that. And, man, you want, you want eSports to blow up because maybe you could be that expert that covers it or commentates on it or helps produce it. Maybe you could be the coach for, 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 for a clan or, or someone who helps uh, – be an agent for that sort of thing because you have an understanding of it that your typical sports or entertainment agent isn't going to have. So let it be. Support it. Anything that makes everything bigger and brings in more revenue is only good for that world. Just keep it close to the chest. Don't protect it, but guide it. Kind of like a, like a young child. Hold its hand. Teach it. Teach it. You know, show the way. But you're going to have to let it turn, you know, turn loose. You're going to have, have to, and that's a good thing that you do. You know, so, so love gaming, gaming with all your heart. heart. There's nothing wrong with that. But for those who, yeah, they want to resist it or fear it, don't. Let it be. This is a good thing. This is going to benefit all of us, and it took a long time to get here. There's enough resistance outside of the gaming world. We got our Colin Cowherds in, out there that, you know, are going to fight the idea of this growing all the way. We don't have any resistance from the inside. We got, we got enough, enough of it from the outside. outside. That's right. It's a good thing. I'm excited for it myself. Right. And I think that it's also a fantastic opportunity for 
those players that previously did feel like they couldn't be public about their passions or they couldn't embrace their passions and make, say, a career or a living out of it. Now it's something that is growing and is becoming one of those things where they can now finally go out in the public and be who they are and not be afraid to be who they are. And that is something that even I went through a stage of for a couple years. And that's something, one reason why I'm making the decisions to do what I'm doing now as an adult, because I was that kid, I was that kid gamer. And you know, yeah, boys looked at me weird when I was like, oh, hey, you know, are you playing Pokemon too? I love that game, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and they were they, they looked at me like, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, there, come hang out with us, <laughs> you know? Yeah, there's, there's no, no greater, greater feeling, feeling in the world than being able to be out in the open, open with, with who you are and what you love. And, and yeah, yeah I, I come from that, that too. too. I mean, I, I was... I'm, I'm, I'm sure this might sound weird if, if any, you know, kids watch this, watch the replay of this. But when, when I was in middle, middle school and high school, school, I was actually bullied for being such a big fan of video games. Game. That, that was, was a little hypocritical because some of the people that would bully me for it, I'd, I'd, I'd overhear them in the back of the lunchroom two days later talking about how they just got to the next dungeon in The Legend of Zelda or whatever. So, you know, they were gaming too, and maybe they weren't as into it as I was because, man, I already finished that game like ten times by the time they got that far. But, you know, um... But, but that's, that's what, what it was. was. I was actually picked on for liking this stuff as much as I did and, and, and bullied for it. And, and uh, you know, looking, looking back at it, I must have really loved it even more maybe than I realized at the time because it didn't deter me. Like like, uh, like things do with a lot of times if a kid is into something. They, they kind of get deterred from being who they are because they don't want that pressure, that social pressure or that bullying or whatever. But it didn't drive me away. Um, even, even, though, even if it meant I had a black eye at school, you know, hey, I'm going to proudly sit there and tell you I just finished Metroid and you're going to have to live with that. Um, so, you know, I came up with that and, you know, I was frowned upon, uh, in school and at home for being as into video games as I was. And so what I see going on in the world right now, it feels like a validation to me. I can put on that gaming t-shirt I can walk out. I was wearing a Pac-Man t-shirt at grocery shopping the other day. There's two or three people there. I thought that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. Uh-huh. Um, it feels great. And, you know, like I said, there's no greater feeling in the world. This is who I am. This is what I love. This is my passion. And you can go right out. And there it is. It's part. It's become pop culture. And that's a good thing because that means that you can enjoy it openly and enjoy it with more people. And it can be bigger. I mean, we got pixels. I got a poster behind me. We got a whole movie, a whole summer movie coming out about video game characters attacking the earth. And it's not even the first movie we've had in the past couple of years that have a bunch of video game characters. And I read Wreck It Ralph. This is exciting. It's something that wouldn't have existed even 10 years ago. Exactly, because we don't need to be afraid anymore to go out there and say, look, this is who we are, these are the games that we play, you know, you can accept that or you cannot accept it, but it's not going to change. It's almost like, you know, you had that E3 takeover, it's almost like a video game, like, takeover for society, um, and, I, you know, um, one of those things is, uh, the TV channel, I think, I'm pretty sure that you've heard of that, but I think right now there's kind of like a ESPN, like, gaming channel, I think, I'm not sure that it's, like, kind of, like, in the depths of all the different channels, I believe, but I also n have heard in the past couple years or so that they're planning this big TV station on ESPN just to stream, like, to show, like, live coverage of tournaments and things like that, whether it be fighting game or land games and different stuff like that. And I'm, I'm curious your opinion on that as well, because I know that there have been some controversy recently in regards to ESPN potentially covering, you know, a tournament or an, a gaming event that might ha occur in the future. Yeah, uh, ESPN's Colin Cowherd uh, was none too happy about Heroes of the Storm tournament that aired on ESPN2, and he was very 
condescending and nasty about it. Um, I actually had, had gone to SciFiGames.com and wrote an open letter in response to it that um, actually got more Twitter action than his original broadcast did. Um, <laughs> You know, you know I, which I'm proud, proud of that. that. And, and a, lot a lot of people felt like, wow, look, the gaming guy is actually speaking more reasonably than this supposed professional sports commentator. Um, that's what I was talking about before about resistance. I mean, here you had, you know, a prominent ESPN you know, broadcaster and personality who's fighting against this. So we don't need gaming fighting from within itself because we got a guy like that who's going to try to resist it from the other end. Um, even you know, though I think it's kind of hypocritical because I don't believe he made similar comments the last time ESPN aired the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating contest, contest. <laughs> or, or a spelling bee or a poker tournament, you know, and I'm not knocking hot dog eaters, competitive eaters and, and, uh, and poker tournaments and, and I'm not knocking those people, but right. you know, I, I'm going to also argue all day long that learning how to play video games on a high competitive levels more challenging and takes more practice time than that stuff does. Oh, definitely. Um, or, you know, and it deserves at least as much respect. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I think ESPN as a whole, as a company, is seeing which way the wind is blowing. That's obvious right now with their latest issue of ESPN the magazine. It's a video game-themed issue. They're talking to competitive gamers in there. Uh, that, that don't, don't have ties. They're talking to some, you know, pro athletes who are gamers as well, and that sort of thing. And that's all well and good, but you know, that, that, that shows to me that they, they see which way the wind is blowing, and, and um, you, you, you'd be foolish not to. I mean, bottom line, in the entertainment industry and the broadcasting industries, numbers count, revenue counts, viewership count. And, and they'd have to be a fool to look at the numbers that, let's say, Twitch gets and a lot of these major tournaments on Twitch can get and ignore that. Mm -hmm. It'd be foolish to ignore. It'd be foolish to ignore that the Staples Center sold out for an esports competition. You know, I mean, the Staples Center doesn't sell out for some NBA games, you know, um, that are held in there. So you, you, you can't ignore that sort of thing. And, um, it's still it's early on, and there's a lot of experimentation, and there's a lot of growing pains as well. I would hope that if the day comes where there is like an esports channel like that that is on your, I guess you could say your traditional broadcast medium, broadcast platform like that, that it stems on if they hire the right people. Right. Hopefully they're smart enough to know that they don't know enough about this to maybe handle it with just their internal staff. And they, they go, go out and they, they hire the right people out there that are familiar with what this is, how it needs to be presented, and kind of merge that with a pro sports presentation. And again, I think that would be a good thing if they handled that like that. Right. Hire those that are, you know, well known or already active in their respective gaming, you know, event and tournament communities to kind of come out and help um, revolutionize whatever main TV station they may or may not yeah and, and, and you know to, to look at it you got to look at the pro sports we know now uh, a lot of people bring up mma because it wasn't that long ago or mma was this little tiny thing couldn't you couldn't watch on tv um but look at the history of nascar or the nfl and you see how these things came along and developed um, there's, there's lessons, lessons to be learned in that, that as to that, that I, think I think would apply to esports and still keep esports at its heart what it is and what got it to this point. Right. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out in this past hour to sit down and talk with me just about you know your experience at E3, um, what it is that you do, as well as some of the controversial topics that kind of are occurring right now in the gaming scene. Um, if you would like to follow Patrick Scott Patterson, his information is below as well as my Twitch, Twitter, and Facebook as well if you would like to keep up to date. Is there anything that you would like to say for the viewers? You know, um, I like to, to be accessible, you know, um, with what I do, uh, you know, to, to be clear for those who may not be familiar with me or you know, yeah, to the handful of very loud critics who might, oh, I'm sure, sure will be watching and analyzing this frame by frame. frame. <laughs> um, I don't just speak for myself and my own brand uh, and my own name. Um, obviously, I, I have a vested interest in advancing my, my, my own career, both professionally and personally. 
but I, I'm, I'm not, not just a voice for me. me. I'm, I'm a voice for gamers. gamers. I, I, that's, that's how I present myself out there. I, I love to hear the gamers' opinions. I love to interact with the gamers. Don't be shy on Twitter or via email or you see me in person in an event somewhere. Talk to me. Let me know what's on your mind. Let me know what I can do to help speak better for you as well as myself out there as we continue to try to advance esports and video game culture in general. Definitely. And I think that that's also something... uh, a important message for everybody to hear about. I have a lot of people that will sometimes message me and say, how did you get this interview with this person? Wow, you met that person in the gaming scene? How, how did that happen? And I said, I just walked up to them and I said, hi. That's all you have to do. I said, hi, and I started a conversation with them. They are everybody. Mark, man, you. They're always accessible. All you have to do is walk up and say hi and they'll gladly speak with you. So yeah. I, don't think, I, don't, I, don't I don't think there's, think there's anyone, anyone in the video game, game world that should, should be anything less than that. that. Not as we're we saying right now. We, we talk, talk about it in this. Video gaming and esports, sports, it's grown and it's reached certain, 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 certain new heights. heights. But it's, it's not, not, let's be honest, we're not the NFL. We're not Hollywood. You know, that sort of thing in terms of mainstream acceptance and popularity. There's no reason for anyone prominent or not in the video game world to not be accessible and interact and talk to each other in a positive way because we're all in this together. Even if your opinions on certain things vary, we all have an interest in this whole thing moving forward and uh, I'd like to see more people in the gaming scene infight less and project outward more and help this thing become bigger and bigger. Right. Join together as one team, do all our selective things because we all bring something to the community, but be able to support each other in all the different aspects in order to grow positively the way that the community should. Um, So I definitely agree. Thank you again. And thank you to all the viewers that have stuck it through and tuned in through the whole interview. Thank you for having me. Of course.